in the United States, the Bible has sort of become this cultural touchstone. Um, and people talk about the Bible. They say, I believe the Bible. But there's a massive difference between the Bible, whenever someone's thinking about it, versus what's actually in the text. And a great deal of sort of spiritual existential crises happen when somebody who reads the Bible uh, with an expectation of what's in it suddenly sees there's a huge disconnect and then says, oh, well, obviously, it's the Bible that's wrong, not me. Um, so a couple of common issues that come up, and, and even, when, even whenever you think about this, like even when you know about some of these issues, you can still fall into them. So one of them is treating the Bible as a homogenous book, assuming that everything that happens in Genesis can be read exactly the same as everything in Matthew, and there's no difference between the two, right? And exactly how, exactly the words in Matthew used in English are the same words used in English in, say, Exodus or something like that. Uh, secondly, assuming that a work was written when it is set. Oh, the Gospel of Mark, that describes Jesus' crucifixion, that's 30 AD. Gospel of Mark was written in 30 AD, right? Uh, forgetting the work is translated, that's a big one, right? Just assuming that, oh, well, this is how it is in English, so I don't need to think about alternative translations or if it's been rendered incorrectly or what have you. Um, here's one that's a little bit more, uh, I don't know, academic, I suppose. Equating New Testament and Old Testament composition and transmission history. So, um, quick poll, does anybody know who the Masoretes are? Anybody? Would you Anybody? You want, you want to give an, uh, can you just, would you like to describe who the Masoretes are? Um, I mean, they're sort of a multiple century long tradition of Jewish scholars who studied the, old, the Hebrew Bible and mm -hmm. uh, wrote all sorts of commentaries and uh, sort of links between verses and ideas. Yeah. And what's, what's one thing they're like super well known for? Well, their, uh, their practice of, their particular line of textual variants that they kept. Yeah, exactly. So the Masoretes have this really sophisticated process for copying down the Hebrew Bible. I've read many apologetic work that says, oh, look at the Masoretes. Look at how they had this really sophisticated process for, tra for uh, transmitting the text of the Bible. Um, that's why we can trust the Gospel of Mark, right? <laughs> Without acknowledging that, wait a minute, maybe the Masoretes aren't copying Mark. Um, so that's one, even, one thing. Even or even assuming that Mark was transmitted in the same way that the Masoretes transmitted the... Well, even if you're talking about the yeah. Old Testament. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so a couple of just very brief overview. Uh, most of you probably are aware of what's in the New Testament. Uh, it's 27 books, uh, 22 are letters, 13 attributed to Paul, five that are sort of historical biographical uh, works. Um, now, I mentioned that thing about uh, when they're set may not be when they're written. So let's talk about when they were written. Very broadly speaking, if you were here last semester, you remember this wonderful slide. Uh, they're written during the uh, Roman occupation of Judea at the tail end of the Second Temple period. Uh, so the earliest works are around 45 or so AD, the latest around 95 or 100 uh, AD, of course written in Greek. Um, now, here's just a random fun fact. Uh, who wants to offer what they think the first uh, book in the New Testament was written? James. Good guess. Apocalypse. The Apocalypse of John. Romans or Corinthians? Romans or Corinthians? Yeah. First Corinthians. Anybody? Galatians. Yeah. Hebrews? Ooh, radical. Well, I mean, the answer is nobody really knows, but <laughs> yeah. But the important thing is that most people recognize that the earliest stuff in the New Testament are the letters of Paul. Or, or the letters more generally. Maybe James was written first. Who knows? It's good. It's good. It's good guess. Uh, generally, people would say like Galatians was written first, but literally nobody knows uh, for certain. Um, but the point is that like the letters are written, and then the Gospels are written, and there's like a pretty pretty decent uh, gap between them. Now, I mentioned one uh, uh, thing here about the time frame in which they're written. You can see that tiny little green box where all the New Testament writings uh, fit. In contrast, our Jewish friends, their span goes over several, several centuries. So this is one of the most significant differences between uh, the compositional history of the New Testament and the, uh, and the Old Testament. So just a quick comment about that. Here's a nice little uh, chart for you to kind of scope out uh, approximately the time frame. There's Jesus at around 30 CE. Pauline epistles grouped over here, and the Gospels now, you'll notice I've put 70 as uh, our date. Um, some of you may be mad at me for putting that. This is the 
Like, nobody will get mad if you put this. Um, if you put it earlier than 70, people will say that you're a conservative Bible thumping and all that crazy stuff. Uh, if you put it after 70, people say you're a liberal wing nut. So 70 is like the safe date. Yeah. I would like to voice that it was written simultaneously with the destruction of the temple. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what happened. Yep. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. Are the, th are the three that are at the same time as the Gospel of John, uh, John's epistles? Uh, I think so, yeah. I, I made this a long time ago, and um, I didn't, I think I just grabbed like, Wiki this actually, these are like Wikipedia dates. The Wikipedia dates are like, you know, if, if a hundred nerds on the internet argue and it finally sticks, then that's probably like the least controversial one. So that's the general, uh, that's just the general scope that I do. So that's probably, that may be late. I don't know. If you made this a long time ago, then why is the composition <laughs> on this timeline? That's a good question. <laughs> good question. All right. So uh, a couple of thoughts um, about composition, history, authorship, and the use of sources. So one thing that's often kind of missed is that, you know, sometimes these works are assumed to be written by a single author at one time. Uh, and all the words come directly from his or her brain and put directly on the piece of paper. No editing, no other sources or anything uh, like that. Sometimes people tacitly assume that. Um, but there are several parts, or there are several sections in the New Testament, several works of the New Testament, that include um, sources from outside of the New Testament. Here's a classic example. Paul references a creed in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I deliver to you of first importance what I also receive. So he didn't write this. This is something from, from outside. Uh, perhaps more famously, Luke starts his gospel by saying, uh, many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses. And I too, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, decided to write you also another orderly account, uh, Theophilus. So Luke is essentially saying, and, and the general consensus is that Luke had several written documents as well as eyewitness interviews that he had, and perhaps a, co perhaps a couple of other uh, uh, people that he was able to talk to for his uh, gospel. And then, of course, he also wrote uh, Acts as well. So now one question is, with all this discussion of sources and cross-pollination, one big controversial question is, did the gospels use each other as sources? So here's a quick overview of this major controversy. So did the gospels copy each other? So if you read the three um, gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you read them in parallel, uh, you'll notice that there are a lot of sections that sound almost exactly the same. In fact, there are some sections that do line up exactly verbatim. Many of the stories are the same. They might be in a little bit different order. But in general, the, uh, if you take all the verses and splice them, up into verses, or splice them up independently and then match them up with each other, you get a Venn diagram that looks something kind of like this, where pretty much all of Mark is reproduced in Matthew and Luke. Again, ver verbatim or pretty close to it. Um, there's also a good section of Luke and Matthew uh, that agree with each other about, you know, approximately verbatim. And so there's this question uh, in New Testament scholarship, which is why, like, why, why is there all this overlap? Um, and uh, as scholarship has debated this, there have been approximately 20 different models or solutions that have been suggested as to explain uh, this phenomenon. Does anybody have any? Yeah, go ahead. Does this pretty much just go ahead and prove that Luke is the best gospel? I mean, Luke is the best gospel, but not for this gospel. reason. Because yeah. he's had the most original material. What? It's not so much about the synoptic problem, but I feel like kind of a precursor to understanding the synoptic problem is also recognizing sort of the role of inspiration mm -hmm. when you're talking about the gospels and the Bible as a whole. Because a lot of times we think that the Bible was something that was just dictated yeah. to the authors, and they're just writing down exactly what they were told to write down, pretty much, mm -hmm. from the Holy Spirit or whatever, but it's yeah. a lot more complicated than that. Like, there is a lot of room for them to be copying from these other sources and not just using, you know, mm -hmm. what was told to them and inserting their own personalities into the text and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it gets down to what people assume by the term author. Right? Like we had this discussion uh, a couple of years ago now when we talked about in uh, Old Testament studies, there's a question of mosaic authorship. Right? Did Moses write the five books of, of the Torah? 
well, there's a line in there about Moses dying. So did Moses write that? And if he failed to write, if, if somebody else wrote that, does that mean Moses didn't write it? What do we, like, what do we really mean by author? Has anybody here been on a, a peer-reviewed paper or involved in that process at all? Authorship, authorship disputes on that? No? Interesting. If you ever uh, just like, I don't know, hang out on Google Scholar um, and grab a paper that has like a whole bunch of um, um, names on it, occasionally if you scroll down, you'll see something that says, you know, authorship description, and it describes every author that's on there and exactly what he or she did to contribute to the paper. And sometimes it's like, well, if you say that you're the author of the paper, do you take credit for all of that? Does the principal investigator who oversaw the entirety of the research, is, he's, is he the author? Like, who do we attribute this to? You know? And different fields have different answers to that. Uh, and it's very similar in you know, ancient times. They have different assumptions about authorship and what counts as an author and things like that. And I think that sometimes people get the assumption or have the you know, presupposition that if Matthew didn't write, if, if St. Matthew himself did not write every single word in Greek in the Gospel of Matthew as we have it today, and he borrowed some other work, then he didn't write Matthew, right? Something to that effect. So I said that there are 20 solutions. We're going to go through all of them in the time we have remaining. No, I'm kidding. All right, no, I'm kidding. But uh, this will help sort of organize how to think about it. Um, so the key, the left is no, and the right is yes, OK? So the first question is, are the Gospels literarily independent, OK? In other words, so did anybody copy from anybody? And if you say no, then this is what's called the independence hypothesis. And most people are, that defend this would be more conservative leaning and just say, look, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're all eyewitnesses. They're all describing the same events. Is it any surprise that they sometimes describe things in the same way, right? That's essentially the, the gist behind that. Um, I'm not going to assess this. This is just to get you thinking about some of the views that are on offer, OK? Um, now, once you say the Gospels are literarily dependent on each other or on something else, then you start getting into a fractal world of unending theories, right? Um, and the first big question is, all right, well, if they're literarily dependent on one another, one of them has to have been written first. So which one was written first? Was it Mark? And if you say that uh, Mark was written first, then you have to uh, ask the question, all right, what's the relationship of Luke and Matthew? So if you say that Mark was written first and Luke used Matthew, then there's what's called the Ferrer hypothesis. And basically, um, Matthew borrows from Luke. Luke reads both of them and uh, puts them into his gospel. That's the idea behind that. If you say, no, Luke didn't use Matthew, then you have to explain where, why is it that Matthew and Luke overlap with each other. Um, and this is what's called the two-source hypothesis. And that is there's a lost source called Q that contains the uh, shared double tradition between Matthew and Luke. And this document's been lost, but that was the same document that Luke and Matthew used. So that's those two views, OK? So Does let's anyone know who wrote Q? Mm, that's a good Q question. Anonymous. What if, <laughs> I think, I think, ah, uh, it's a good question. I think the Q is anonymous, though, yeah, for sure. All right, um, perhaps we should abbreviate it, Q anon. Let's back up to, did Mark, uh, was Mark written first? So. Maybe, maybe Mark wasn't written first, all right? So that whole line of thinking was assuming Mark was the first one. Uh, well, maybe Mark took Matthew and Luke and smushed them together to produce his document. Um, and that's what's called the Griesbach hypothesis. And you think, that's a really nasty name. Well, it's a really nasty theory, because nobody likes this. I don't like it. It doesn't make any sense, frankly. Like, for example, just one argument against this. And to tell you the truth, my, my personal opinion, I think most of this is just academic frou-frou, like it's a, most of this is a waste of time, I think. There's no way you could possibly reconstruct uh, what actually happened. But of these, I think the Griesbach hypothesis deserves all the like, hate it gets. Because that, like, think about the guy who wrote Mark, all right, under this, under the, under this scenario. He read Matthew, and right, hmm, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, hmm, that's some good stuff. Reading in Luke, all right, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, hmm. Yeah, we don't need either of those. We're going to cut both of those out. Um, but I have this story over here that is about uh, some pigs getting thrown off a cliff. Let's put that in place instead, right? That really doesn't track with how an editor would put these gospels together, I don't think. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that guy that ran away. Yeah, uh, he was naked, by the way. Fun fact, yeah. So the, the editorial decisions required by Mark in order for this theory to make sense are, I think, kind of ridiculous myself. 
Apparently this is having like a resurgence though. There was a book published a couple years ago uh, defending it. I'm not gonna read it. Um, <laughs> like, I think it's just a bunch of contrarians, you know. Anyway, so, all right, well, if that's ridiculous, then maybe uh, Matthew and uh, Mark were uh, smushed together to uh, make Luke. And this is what Augustine actually uh, thought, um, that guy from the 400s. Um, and if you don't subscribe to any of these five major hypotheses, then you're, you start getting into some really weird stuff like the Papias document, Q plus, Q minus, like it's weird, we won't go down there. There's actually, believe it or not, on believe it or not, like Wikipedia, as much hate as it gets, has a really good article on this, just outlining all of the different views, and has like nice, nice little graphics that points out all the errors. Does Wikipedia as much data as it gets? Mm-hmm. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Anyway, so let's just talk about this. Uh, does anyone have an opinion about any of this, or would anyone be uncomfortable with anything other than the independence hypothesis? I'd be uncomfortable with the grease puck hypothesis, but just because of its name. Sounds like a greasy back. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the Mark plus Luke equals Matthew hypothesis is underrated. You're talking about Augustine's view? Yeah. Well, no. The, uh, the, weird, the things get weird view. Oh, <laughs> you're off over here. Yeah. The Jimmy Aiken view. Oh, no. All right, so that's just some interesting uh, discussion. We're not gonna talk about it this semester at all, um, so if you're hoping to get a resolution, too bad. Um, it's, uh, yeah. I, I don't think it, it's a question, it's an interesting question, but I don't think it's as serious to, uh, other than just sort of academic interest. But I will say that the general assumption that at least I make, and that most people make when you're reading a New Testament document is what's called the two source. So this is sort of like the majority view. I don't, it, or it, it's like, if you read a book and they don't bring up the synoptic problem, it's probably because they're already assuming this. Uh, this is essentially, Mark was written first, Matthew and Luke both used Mark. They also used an unknown document called Q, which has since been lost, um, and that's how you explain all of that. It's nice and neat. For every tradition, there is a document, is essentially how that works out. So if you were to put all of the stuff together, this is sort of an example of how you know, we talked about sometimes people assume the New Testament is just these independent works with no outside anything, no interconnectedness or anything. But just the ones that we've talked about here, you can start to see that even just the four Gospels and, uh, um, and one of Paul's letters, you can see that there's actually a lot going into it. Um, and it's a lot more of a, a, a sort of like a nebulous net rather than a self-contained uh, uh, collection of books. All right, so that's just a, yeah. Is there ever any, uh, anyone who talks about why John doesn't really borrow any ma material from the synoptics? Because it seems kind of odd that John is written much later, but he doesn't um, there, any of them. Yeah, there's some, there's some stuff out there about uh, assuming that he does, um, but I don't really, I don't really know. Yeah, why is, why is John different? Some people offer, offer that as an explanation, but I, I, I don't know. I think it just really is. There's an entirely different. So let me actually just back up a second and sort of give a, a very nebulous, fuzzy view, which is essentially that I think people underestimate, and, and there, there's another view out there that has this, which is essentially you underestimate how quickly an oral tradition can get fixed um, and how quickly certain terms can start to get sort of frozen in a particular community. Uh, and the basic idea behind that is that perhaps all the commonality with Matthew, Mark, and Luke started with a community of people that preserved Jesus' teachings in a fixed form and in a fixed way uh, and then passed it amongst themselves and then that was ultimately how it got preserved in a document. But the Johannine community, which was you know, followed by John and not, uh, not by Matthew, Mark, Luke, et cetera, uh, perhaps they just had a different way of encapsulating Jesus' teachings and that was how it became fixed. And so you just have like, in, instead of like a break in the material continuity, you just have two different oral traditions that have been preserved in two different um, uh, textual traditions as well. It's like, like I said, you're, you're, getting, you're getting deep into stuff where there's no material out of state, like there's no falsifiability or anything. So it's just speculation. Yeah, I don't know about that. So that's a little bit of, yeah. Okay. What I've heard is that they all had different reasons for writing the Gospels, and they were focusing on different aspects, and that John just wasn't focused as much on the narrative of 
Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that some next week because there are parallels, for example, like the feeding of the 5,000. The, the, in addition to the triple tradition, there is like quadruple cr tradition and stuff that is uh, parallel. So we'll talk some more about that next week and sort of uh, compare similarities and differences. Uh, a quick preview of two weeks from now. So that's a, a, some, this is basically like um, one of the big issues related to the composition and authorship of the Gospels and to an extent Acts. Um, but when it comes to the epistles, the big debate is, uh, did Paul write everything that's ascribed to him? Um, so I have here a nice little chart. Uh, I'm not going to step on Ben's toes. Ben will talk about this in two weeks in detail. But just so that you're aware of the debate here, there are 14 letters that traditionally have had Paul's name sort of loosely associated with them. Uh, but in contemporary scholarship, there are only seven that are like universally, everyone agrees, okay, yeah, Paul actually wrote this, no question. There are three of those that are kind of debated, and there are three that people will be really mad at you if you say that Paul actually wrote them. Um, and you can kind of see, this was, a, this was a survey done in, uh, where was this? This was just some random meeting of British academics on the New Testament, and uh, whoever was there uh, surveyed them saying, okay, what's the breakdown of what percentage do people think about the authorship, et cetera. So you get the idea of how, uh, how those things line up. And you can see that um, Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians, it's kind of you know, free for all. Uh, first, Second Timothy, and Titus, things are a little bit, a little bit dicey. I, I don't know that those 25% are necessarily in the best position uh, safety-wise. Yeah? Do you happen to know off the top of your head who the uh, contrarian with regards to Philippians authorship is? <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't know. But the, anyway, yeah. But yeah, so th this is one of the debates. So we're actually going to look. So the question is, all right, why do people think this? Like, why do people think Paul didn't write certain things? Um, yeah. And just to complicate this matter, like, what do we even mean by right? So for example, you know, Romans 16 literally says, I, Tertius, wrote this letter. And yet Romans is an undisputed letter by Paul. How does that work, right? Or I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. First Corinthians, yeah, undisputed. But then I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Second Thessalonians, ah, that's a question. No, that's not going to work, right? How does this work? So when we talk about what we mean by authorship and writing, there's already some degree of complication when there are literal texts in these letters that say Paul did or didn't write and you know, disparities to that. Anyway, we'll talk about that in two weeks. All right, we're running uh, a little low on time, so I think I will just skip through the next 55 slides really fast. All right, the last thing is, all right, we've talked a lot about the composition of these texts, but how do they actually get transmitted to us today, right? Um, and this is a question of uh, textual transmission. Um, so we don't have the originals, we don't have the little piece of paper Paul wrote, we don't have signed by Paul. It would be nice if we did, it would resolve a lot of debates. What we have are, of course, copies of copies of copies of copies of texts from a long time ago. Um, to give you an idea of what these things look like, uh, here's a sample of what are called papyrus fragments. So these are like the earliest, earliest copies of uh, the New Testament. This is the earliest to date. Um, this is not to scale. This is probably like this big in real life. Um, it's a little scrap of papyrus from about 125 AD from the Gospel of John. A couple of other random ones there. If you can look at them at the Center for the Study of the New Testament Manuscripts. Um, now, these get a lot of press because it's like, oh, look how early they are. But come on, there's like two verses on there, if even that, right? So it can be a bit misleading to say, oh, look at these super early things, therefore we can trust the New Testament, right? Um, the, really what you're reading, more than likely, is a translation of a codex. Uh, probably Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Vaticanus. These are... Uh, complete text of the entire 27 books of the New Testament. For the most part, there's like a couple of pages missing here and there. Uh, but these, for the most part, form the backbone of whatever translation you're, uh, you're reading. With the other, te uh, the other manuscripts are used like a supplementary uh, material for that. So sometimes people say, all right, how many uh, manuscripts do we have? What do we have? When do we have it? Et cetera, et cetera. Here's like, all right, this is another like beef I have with you know, people that say, oh, I'm an apologist. I'm going to defend the faith. 
don't do this if, you, if, you're, if you're wanting to do this. Do not say, we have 5,800 Greek manuscripts, therefore, therefore we have 5,800 copies of the 27 books of the New Testament, right? It's not how that works. There are 5,800 Greek manuscripts, but they are distributed across time and space and location in the Bible. So here is a better picture of what attestation of the New Testament looks like. This is going to be a bit weird to read, so I'll walk you through it. Look over here on the left. On the outer uh, circle here, these are all of the books of the New Testament, and they're subdivided into chapters. Everywhere where there's a tick, that's a single attestation to that, uh, to that chapter. This is all the attestation we have in the second century. Okay? So people will say things like, we have 5,800 Greek manuscripts, some of which go all the way back to the 100s AD. That would be three or four. Like, this is what we're talking about. Once you go back to the 200s AD, then you get most of the New Testament attested. If you go over there, starting in the center, you have the 3rd century, 4th century, 5th. Yeah. And then it comes all the way out. So, yeah, that's actually a very good point. You'll notice that if you can't read it, it starts with Mark over in the, uh, uh, in the red. Um, it's, or is that Matthew? Sorry, Matthew. Yeah. Yeah, it's in canonical order. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, et cetera, all the way around. So you'll notice that the coverage of the manuscripts is very heavily uh, focused in the Gospels and especially in, in John, whereas you know, things get kind of spotty in the letters and a little spotty in, in Revelation. So one of the things that's important is that you know, if you're discussing uh, is there a textual variant in place or what's the textual integrity of this passage, it's not homogenous across the New Testament. There's not 5,800 attestations of every verse in the New Testament. There's 5,800 scraps of paper all the way up to complete codices uh, everything in between, and so it's a good idea to you know be cognizant of what's actually attested and what it isn't. Yeah. Is there any comparison of, uh, myths to say other ancient sources like Josephus or like um, if you were to put Josephus or some of the other historians of the time? You put Josephus on here, and there's like there's like a dozen manuscripts, so you can't even make a point like this. Yeah. Right. A small a small one. So. Yeah. You can do it with the. The other thing is that 5800 is largely like medieval manuscripts. Yep. This is just going up to the 8th century. Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask what is the cutoff for it being a manuscript? Like, if it's handwritten. Uh, like 1560. <laughs> like it literally is just manuscript, handwritten. So Technically, if I wrote the Gospel of John on a piece of paper, it would be a manuscript. It won't have, be useful, but. 5800. Yeah. You have one verse of the Gospel of John. Let's get to work. <laughs> <laughs> it's rookie numbers. Rookie numbers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so I will, of course, uh, buzz through this really quickly. So a really good book. So the reason I point this out is that, like, I I kind of got burned by this a long time ago. I first was reading about like textual integrity of the New Testament. Thought, oh, this is super cool and whatnot. There's a lot of misinformation out there. When I mention, watch how I go full circle here. Remember when I mentioned Josh McDowell at the very beginning? One of the things that Josh McDowell and, and you know, uh, peace be upon him and all that, but the, like, that group of people in the 70s are responsible for perpetrating a lot of myths about, I say myth, a lot of falsehoods about the, uh, about the, about the text of the New Testament. One of them being, it's the best attested in the world, uh, nothing even comes close to it. Also, the differences, you know, when you count them all together, there's like 500,000 differences. But you have to divide that by 5,800 because every time there's a manuscript, that counts as one, right? And so they like bring down the variant number by dividing. That's not how that works, right? I don't know how many of you have heard that. Hopefully, hopefully not. But this book, Myths and Mistakes of New Testament Criticism, is a really good corrective to sort of the overstatements uh, that have been made in that. So I highly recommend that. Um, and if you're curious about like the numbers, it's really impossible to estimate variants because there's an entire chapter here on how do you count a variant, and the answer is there's like seven answers to how you count it. And depending on how you count it, you can have like a million or like 2,000. Like it's, it's crazy. So the generally accepted value, though, is about 500,000. That means that there are 500,000 variant ways that you can read something in the New Testament. Um, they're, of course, not all, uh, and that's non-spelling variants. So if you add spelling differences, it goes even higher. Um, and most of these are like not really that big of a deal. Here are two that are just kind of whatever. Um, there's like a longer version in Matthew. Uh, he says, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you. 
uh, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. The section in brackets is not attested in some uh, scripts. But the big three that people really uh, talk about are these three. Th these are like the big variants that actually shake things around in, in the New Testament. The story of the woman caught in adultery um, is the longest by far. It is excluded in almost all of the early manuscripts of John. Uh, it's mostly in late manuscripts. And in some manuscripts, it changes its location. So it's sort of a floating story. Most people think that it's, an inauth it's inauthentic to the original Gospel of John. Maybe a true story, but not included. The long ending of Mark, of course, uh, they'll pick up snakes with their hands. Very grateful that one's probably fake or like a, probably not authentic, probably not originally in there. That's a good one. Um, and then the last one, of course, is the comma Ioannium in 1 John. So uh, if you read a KJV, for example, it'll say that there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. Nice Trinity apologetics. Sadly, probably not original. It's probably, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like an early version, yeah. Yeah, but the, uh, the spirit, the water, and the blood is probably what that is. So those are the big three. Um, very quickly, how do you resolve these differences? There are two answers. The first one is count them, whichever, you know, the, what's called the majority text. Uh, if you just count them up, whichever one has the most attestations, the right one, and that's that. The other one is what's called weighing the manuscripts, which is, well, actually, not all manuscripts are created equal. Some of them are later. Some of them are earlier. Some of them are from different geographies. Um, perhaps we need to privilege the ones that are earlier rather than the ones that are later. Just because there may have been an error that was really early and then got multiplied a whole lot. So you know, we need to think about that a little bit carefully. This is a big debate. Uh, some people think that if you uh, deny the majority text, then uh, you're denying that God has preserved his word. It's a whole thing. All right, to quickly conclude, New Testament is a collection of works, not a homogenous book. We can't impose our modern understandings of texts and get mad whenever it doesn't meet our expectation. Originally written in Koine Greek, the text of the New Testament has been preserved by scribes, hand-copying manuscripts through the centuries.